crowd that is even threatening, at the very least implicitly threatening. That's exactly what Pilate is up against as he tries to read his decision concerning Jesus to the crowd. Pilate has been clear. He's made a decision. He he states it plainly three times. The crowd continues to push back, and they're loud, and they're uniform in their decision. And they're, in fact, threatening, at least in an implied way. And we see as we go through the passage whether or not Pilate can stick to his guns if he can toe the line or keep his resolve in the face of a crowd that is loud, uniform, threatening, and in fact increasing in its urgency and volume level the whole time. And I think that we live in the midst of such a crowd for the first time in history. All the time, I think we live in such a crowd made possible because of digital communication as we know it. Uh, We now carry in our pockets what 10 years ago, 20 years ago, was a supercomputer that maybe only the military had. We carry it in our pocket now. And we're connected at all times to the internet. And if ever there was a democratizing experience, it was the internet. And so now, in real time, at all times, Every voice with access to any type of digital device, some of your kitchen appliances can probably text and get YouTube now, we stand shoulder to shoulder with all of the rest of the world, everybody given equal voice to whatever is going on. This is unique. It's only the last decade in which this has happened. I want you to ponder this for a minute. For those of you that are, say, mid to young teenager and down, you don't understand the shift that has occurred. For those of you that are a little bit older, you do understand the shift that has occurred. When I was younger, the thought of speaking to the President of the United States was just a dream. Normal people don't really get to do that. But we live in an era where now average people, and this has happened many times now, tweet something on a social media platform And the leader of the free world answers in the same day. Now, we live in the midst of a global crowd. We are standing shoulder to shoulder with all other voices on the planet interacting in real time. And so what Pilate faced, trying to make a decision regarding Jesus, trying to make a decision regarding truth in general, in the face of a crowd that is loud, unified, and at least uh, implicitly threatening, I think we face all day, every day as Christians in a connected world. And so the situation that Pilate is facing, I'm going to argue that we are facing in an even greater way because our crowd is seven billion strong. His probably numbered only in the hundreds or thousands. So I want to pray for us, and I want to walk through this, and I want us to put ourselves, interestingly, in Pilate's shoes. We're going to see, you know the story, that the crowd was too much for him, which begs the question even more, if the crowd will not be too much for us, how? How do we as Christians make wise, godly decisions over the noise of a crowd that is loud unified, and at least implicitly threatening, and generally speaking, opposed to God and his ways. We stand in one sense with Pilate this morning, and we need to avoid his path. So let me pray for us. In fact, I will read straight through these verses and then pray for us, and we'll go back through them. Let's start in verse 13, because here, Pilate has already weighed the decisions. He's spoken to Jesus, sent him to Herod, brought him back, and now he is issuing his official decree carrying all the weight and authority of the Roman Empire. He's about to pronounce sentence on Jesus. Look at 23, 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. 
And after examining him before you, behold, listen carefully, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And neither did Herod. For Herod sent him back to us. Look, he says emphatically, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore release, uh, punish, and release him. Now look at the next verse because it's the first of three but they statements. In the face of demonstrable truth, with evidence behind it, three times Luke has to write, but they of the crowd. Look at verse 18. But they all cried out together, away with this man, and released to us Barabbas, a man uh, who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, uh, and for murder a man actually guilty of the thing that Jesus is being accused of, though he is innocent. Verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. Here it is a second time. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. Now a third time, Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? I found, him, uh, I found in him no guilt deserving death. Could Pilate be any clearer? I will therefore punish and release him now for a third time. But they, the crowd, were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. Now here's the, the key to this. If you are a highlighter, you might highlight this. And their voices prevailed. And their voices prevailed. That's what won the hour. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. Changed his mind in response to their voices, not the truth. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Three times Pilate reasoned, pleaded, pointed to the truth, pointed to the lack of evidence against Jesus. Three times, but they cried out. The crowd refused to yield, instead lifted up their voices loudly uniformly and with implied threat. They were saying, we'll riot if you don't listen. And so at the end of that, not truth, not reason, simply their voices prevailed. So Pilate released Barabbas and delivered Jesus over to be crucified. Let's pray. Father, if ever there was a day in which a crowd is unified, is loud, is at least implicitly threatening, and oftentimes at odds with your truth, it is today. Lord, this technology that you have allowed to be created is such a wonderful and blessed gift and being used for so much good across the planet, and we thank you for the seeming miracle of these technological advancements being used to glorify you and exalt Christ and teach scripture and win the lost unto salvation. Father, we thank you for this technology and for the multitude ways it's being used for your glory. And Father, we recognize together this morning that it's also being used in another way. That these technologies instant communication on many platforms across the globe gives voice to any crowd that wants to stand loudly, unified, even threateningly against your truth. And so, Father, I pray that as Christians, you would help us not to disengage, to retreat from the world, but to take our stand in the middle of the crowd and be able to make decisions over the noise of the crowd. God, we need your help. It is not easy. And so I pray that you would help 
us to understand where Pilate went wrong and where we can go right. Father, guide us in this tricky day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go back through these verses briefly. Uh, look at this. Starting in verse 18, you've already seen in 13 uh, down to 16 that Pilate has been very clear. I find him guilty of none of these charges. The man is innocent. We need to beat him up a little and let him go. I'll rough him up to make you happy, but he is innocent of all charges. And then we get the first of three, but theys. But they all cried out together. Interesting, three different times Luke says that they cried out or shouted out or loud cries, and all three he uses a different word in the original language. I think that he's going out of his way, just like you would if you're writing a letter and trying to describe something carefully, you would choose different words to try to show different angles of this thing. This is a cacophonous din. This is loud. This is an angry mob that's shouting and arguing and crying out. And so he uses different words each time he comes to it to picture the insanity of the moment. But they all cried out, picturing this is not a calm discussion. They are not sitting down and trying to map out some good logic on the page. We don't see a whole lot of that today, do we? <laughs> and neither was this crowd doing that. They're simply crying out, but notice that they're crying out together. Whatever it is that they're shouting, which we see in a minute, crucify, crucify him, they are together. They are together. This is a very different scene from a week earlier when Jesus rode in like a king and they waved palm branches. I take it that this is mostly different people gathered now. Maybe some of those people were disenfranchised that Jesus didn't overthrow the Roman government. But here is a crowd that looks very different and they are crying out and they are doing so together. They're not only loud, but they are uniform, loudly and uniformly. It is hard to speak truth when you are in the minority. Maybe you've been in that position in school or among your friends or in your family. It is hard to speak truth when you are in the minority. Interestingly, Pilate here, who doesn't believe in Jesus, is attempting to speak truth while he is the minority voice, and yet they are loud and they are uniform and they are insistent. Look down to verse 21. Pilate tries again. He tries again in verse 20, addressing them once more, desiring to release Jesus. Here's our second, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Another word for shouting, and the key here is that they kept on shouting. There was no placating this crowd. Pilate is an intelligent man. He wouldn't have gotten to the place that he got being a dummy. That's not true. Some people in the ancient world were put there and they were dummies just because they were born into the right family. Uh, but he surely is a fairly shrewd individual. He's trying his best to convince this crowd. No doubt what Luke has given us is a truncated version. More words were spoken than just these. He's probably pleading with them, reasoning with them. I don't understand. Look at the evidence. You couldn't produce a single uh, good witness. The ones you did contradicted each other, we know from the other accounts. He's trying and trying and trying, but they, 21, kept shouting. They are persistent in their loud and uniform objection to the truth that Pilate, of all people, is trying to speak publicly about Jesus. The poor guy, no doubt, is getting uh, a little frustrated. He's used to a public scene, being a leader. He's had people mad with him more than once before. But he's thinking, I don't want this innocent fellow's blood on my hands. I have some kind of limits. So he tries yet again. Look at this. A third time, verse 22, he said to them, why? What evil has he done? He's saying, seriously? We've got murderers and actual insurrectionists currently in custody, and not one of you came and protested outside of the courtroom. Why are you making such a stink about this guy that everybody can see is innocent? I found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish him, release him, and for a third time, verse 23, but they 
were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. Yet another word for shouting out. This time, loud cries, a word sometimes used of animal cries, focusing more on the sound of the cry than on uh, a cry itself or even necessarily a spoken cry. Luke is telling us this is like a ravenous crowd simply screaming out their disapproval of Jesus, their disapproval of God's truth. Sort of like a pack of wolves, they are making noises against God and his truth. Not only do they have loud cries like that, but their cries are both urgent and demanding. They are urgent, we must do something and we must do it now, and they are demanding, here is what you will do for us, and we will not stop until you do. They are urgent and they are demanding. Well, at this point, Pilate could see that things were getting worse, not better for his angry crowd. He could hear that they were getting louder, not quieter. He could hear that they were chanting more in unison, not less. And he was picking up what they were laying down. This is the point where in modern day, they'd be shaking the barrier fences. They'd be climbing the business windows and pounding on the glass. This is what you've seen many times on the news yourself in modern days. They were threatening riot. Well, Pilate's primary job under uh, the emperor is to keep the peace at all costs. <laughs> They're threatening a riot, and Pilate says, okay, okay, fine. He didn't want to kill an innocent man, but he doesn't care enough about the truth uh, to lose his job over it or be executed for it. And so finally, he simply caves in. But I want you to see again in the second half of verse 23 and 24 what he caved in to. This is very important. They did not on a level playing field convince him of the truth that they were speaking. They did not convince him that what he was saying was wrong. They did not marshal any kind of new evidence. They did not show him that it would be better for all involved. They simply raised their voices louder, more uniformly, and more threateningly until, look at the end of verse 23, until their voices prevailed. Their voices, not the truth, prevailed. This is like twin toddlers in an echoey kitchen who discover dad's breaking point. They wail until their demand is granted. That's voices winning. When our kids were quite young, we decided to try to drive through the night. Back when Shauna and I were young enough to even dream of such a thing, driving through the night. Now by 10, it's time to stop. But we decided they're young, they'll just sleep. In our minds, they would snuggle down in their little car seats with their warm little blankies and their happy little stuffed animals and their happy little passies, and they would just sleep soundly, dreaming happy thoughts, and we would get 12 hours of quiet highway behind us, and we would pull in, and the sun would be rising, and the kids would be saying, I love you, Mommy, I love you, Daddy. I've never slept so well in all my life. Let me tell you something. After about four hours of screaming, I've never felt so desperate in my life. I was feeling, frankly, it was scary. I don't want to put it into words. We finally, both of us, me more so, said, that's it. And I saw the next glowing hotel sign, didn't care what it was. I pulled in, squealing tires, and threw my wallet at the person and said, give us a room, any room. And we tucked those poor babies into bed, and we never attempted to drive through the night again. Amen? And uh, that's called their voices prevailed. <laughs> I felt it in my gut. This is what Pilate felt. He looked out at the crowd and their voices prevailed. They were loud, they were uniform, and there was implied threat. And when they reached a certain level, he could take it no more, and he decided, I would rather silence them than anything else. And so he allowed an innocent man to be delivered over to death. The truth did not prevail. Reason did not prevail. 
their voices prevailed. We've all been there. Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. Here's where this gets dangerous. My children's voices simply wanted to lay down somewhere. Their voices had a different demand. The crowd's voices demanded crucify, crucify him. The pilot, the crowd's voice cried out for innocent blood. Pilate was willing to compromise even on that level. And I want you to notice, verse 24, that he decided, Pilate decided their demand should be granted. He changed his mind. He looked at all of the evidence that he had stood and previously boldly declared in public, innocent, 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 three times, but because their voices prevailed, he decided. He changed his heart and mind based on the volume and intensity of the crowd around him. And I would say that you and I run the risk of doing the same every day that we live in the middle of a world that is, generally speaking, bent against Christ. He made a decision based on the noise and uniformity and implied threat of the crowd, even though his decision caused him to violate the sound reason that he had already publicly laid out three times and pleaded with them to accept. In the end, Pilate's desire to fit into this crowd, <laughs> to be liked by his subjects at least enough that they would not start a riot, determined his course of action. And as I said in the beginning, I think, I think that because of our digital age, we live in the midst of a crowd more than ever before. It used to be, if you wanted to be in the midst of a crowd, you had to get in your car and go somewhere. Those of you that are my age and older, do you remember when hanging out with people and talking to your friends required getting in the car and going somewhere? This is a novel idea, it's wild, right? Some of you would go to the roller rink. I've seen those pictures or to a football game, or to whatever it was, to gather together with others, to even experience a crowd. But now we have the comment section of YouTube. Now we have Twitter, now we have Instagram and Snapchat, and whatever else people are using this month that they weren't last month. The total effect of all of it is that we have created a seven billion member strong crowd where every voice gets equal airtime to the degree that unknown people in the middle of nowhere can make a comment and have a response in the same day from world leaders. More than ever before, we are a unified crowd. I notice that the crowd typically is loud. I notice that the crowd is often unified, and I dare say not usually in the right direction. And I notice that the crowd often has an implied threat. We stand in an odd way like Pilate. God has given us a clear standard for truth-based decision-making, a standard that doesn't change no matter how loud, uniform, or threatening the crowd becomes. But even in understanding and applying this standard, we need to do a little work. First, let me show you the standard. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We could look at Deuteronomy 4 and 5 and 6 this morning and make this point even stronger, but I'll leave you to do that on your own. I'll read simply from Deuteronomy chapter 6. When God is ready to lead his people into Israel, he's going to tell them how to live. He knows that they're going to face new technologies. He knows that they're going to move through stages of human history. He knows that they're going to walk before him in difficult and confusing circumstances as individuals, as families, as a nation. God knows that they will experience all of the things that we are experiencing now. And so he tells them how to survive a time like this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 starting in verse 1. Now this is the commandment. The statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess that land, so that you may fear the Lord your God. 
you and your son and your son's son by keeping all his statutes and his commandments. How do we live in the midst of a difficult world that's crying against God? Well, Moses tells them by following the standard that doesn't change while everything else is. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life. But, well, what about when those days get hard? But what about those days in which the implied threat of the crowd means I might be ostracized or lose a friend or fired from my job? What if that means that I might have to go up against a school board? Well, he says, I command you to obey all the days of your life and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. Why? Because pretty soon your children are going to be in the middle of this crowd called modern America without you there to guide them. And they desperately need something that isn't changing that will help them make decisions in the middle of that crowd. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise and you shall bind them the truth of scripture on your hand. You shall bind them as a, as a sign on your hand and they shall be like frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. And I'll stop there for the sake of time, but you need to read Deuteronomy 4 and 5 and 6 and see this theme fleshed out. God is telling them you're about to enter a new chapter as a history. You're going to enter a beautiful land with tremendous opportunities, but every one of those opportunities comes with a dark side. Every one of those opportunities can be misused and may lead you astray away from my voice. And so God told them, I'm going to give you a standard that you can apply to life, but you're going to have to love the standard, read the standard, commit it to heart, teach your children, talk about it when you sit at the table, talk about it when you drive around in the car. He says, this standard will allow us to think and make decisions over the noise of a crowd, no matter how loud, how uniform, or implicitly threatening that crowd becomes. It's not enough to say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. There's a little more to the equation. Our decisions about important matters against the roar of a crowd like I'm discussing must rest on a three-legged stool. It's three legs to this stool that our decisions and thinking must rest on. We need to make decisions biblically. We need to make decisions theologically. And we need to make decisions historically. Did you catch that? Write that down if you're a note taker. I've said this many times, but not enough. All of our decisions must be made biblically. We need to ask, what does the Bible say? All of our decisions must be made theologically, asking, how does what the Bible says here fit into the big picture of Scripture? How does this fit with other truths that God has revealed in His Word? And we need to make decisions historically. We do not live in a vacuum. The things that we are wrestling with, others have wrestled with for 2,000 years. We need to ask, what has the church believed and practiced from the apostles? to the church fathers, some of whom were taught directly by the apostles who wrote the New Testament. But right on down to today, we have to think biblically, theologically, and historically if we will successfully make decisions over the roar of a crowd that's bent, generally speaking, against God. Now, I want to give you a brief case study. A brief case study using one of the issues that is a hot-button issue in our day that you cannot escape if you read the news or anything or look at billboards or watch television. I want to use the idea of gender identity very simply. What is gender? Can it be defined? 
This is a hot button issue in our day. And I'm going to very briefly, we don't have nearly enough time to deal with this subject this morning, but I want to show you how we might think biblically, theologically, and historically about this issue as we make our own decisions and teach our own children. So let me use this as a bit of a case study. First, we need to think about the cries of the crowd. The crowd that we live in today is crying that gender is in no sense a binary decision with male and female. That gender is up for grabs, that it's variously defined as many ways as you want to define it, and that every individual must make their own decisions regarding their own. In fact, we talk about gender identity, not gender, because gender is not a thing, really. It's gender identity that's being spoken of. You say, well, why do you call this a cry of the crowd? Well, in 2017, January issue of National Geographic, those of you that subscribe know, released a special issue on the, quote, gender revolution, unquote. The website right now, I checked again this morning, and if you go to National Geo and you search for that issue, the January 2017 portion of their website calls it a, quote, historic special issue. And it comes, unlike any of the other special issues that I've seen, with a discussion guide for teachers and parents to download so that you can teach your children how properly to examine uh, the open field of gender identity so that they can make their own decisions quite apart from that which we might thrust on them. This is a parental discussion guide that you can download and use at home or in the classroom. Mattel Toy Company, just this week, has released a line of six gender-neutral dolls, just in time for Christmas, mind. Are they social warriors, or are they just in time for Christmas? <laughs> they can answer that, I don't know. But they're designed to be styled, in their words, um, as male, female, neither, or both. This is up to the, the user, not the parent, mind. This is up to the child. You can Google this, it's right there. Mattel Toy Company, it's a line of six so far gender neutral dolls, in their words, to be styled as male, female, neither, or both. Now, they say they don't want to make a political statement, but they do want to celebrate inclusivity. That's their statement. We don't want to make a statement, but we do want to celebrate inclusivity. A friend of mine in California was told that his kids, who are in a public school system there, are required to attend the health classes in which discussing gender uh, fluidity and gender identity will be taught. He said, well, I'd rather keep my kids home that day if that's okay, we'll do our own teaching on the subject. They said, no, you're not allowed to exempt your students from that particular session. And if you keep them home, you will have to make up the sessions. But they have to go through the uh, state mandated material on gender identity and fluidity and inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting. Is that required? Last I knew, if you skip a math class, you're not required to make it up. You can just get a lower grade on that homework assignment. Last I knew, if you skip an English assignment, you just get a lower grade. They might give you an F. But in this case, he's being told by his individual school district anyway, nope, your kids are not allowed to skip, and if they do, they will be required to go through it in another format. So this is why I say that the idea of gender identity gen generally, the idea of gender identity generally is part of the cry of the crowd today. And we as Christians are being called on to give an answer. We don't have enough time to wade into this, as I said, but I do want to, just by way of case study, make a few comments biblically, theologically, and historically to show that all three legs of the stool are necessary. And before I even do this, let me give a caveat, because I want to be very careful. There are some who would call themselves Christians who want to act ungraciously toward those that may identify uh, as transgender, homosexual, etc. Those that want to act in harmful ways or hateful ways toward those who are, biblically speaking, confused as to their uh, gender. 
We cannot be among them. We must go with the love of Jesus, who before a woman caught in adultery, sentenced to death by those around her, he dismissed the crowd and then said, where are those who accuse you? She said, I don't know, they're gone. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Jesus was overwhelming in his offer of grace to her. He carefully defined her lifestyle as sinful, but he also said, I do not condemn you. He offered salvation to her. And I've told you before of the conversation that my, my uh, dear mother had with a transgender individual that she was working alongside of in the Meals for Wheels program, who finally opened up to her sense that this is a safe person to talk to, and said, I'm just so confused. Sometimes I don't know who I am, and through tears, said, I just don't know what to do or who I am, and it's so hard. And my, my uh, mother listened and thought for a moment when she relayed this story. I thought, oh, dear, mother, what did you say? <laughs> and um, she said, well, God knows exactly who he made you to be. And Jesus died for your sins just as he died for mine. And if you'll trust in him, then he'll forgive you of your sins and he will help you understand who you are to be. He will save you. <laughs> now, friends, that's an answer. That's an answer that we need to graciously give to those around us. Now, let me look at this now biblically, theologically, and historically. Biblically, the scriptures state with clarity the scriptures state unequivocally. Now, some of you may not like what I'm sharing this morning on this case study. If that's the case, that's okay. But let's sit and talk through that together. Because I want to show you biblically, theologically, and historically why we say this. Because here's what the scripture says on this issue. Genesis 1, and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So whatever is happening in mankind is a reflection of the image of God. Male and female, God created them. And then God blessed them. Having called them male and female, he put his blessing upon them. And he said to them, now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So something in their maleness and their femaleness was required in the way that God intended for them to glorify him, to reflect his image to a watching world. Namely, that Adam and Eve, male and female, could propagate, could fill the earth and subdue it. And so maleness and femaleness is not incidental. It is central to what it means to be human in the image of God. Genesis 5, 2 says again, male and female, God created them. And he blessed them and he named them man, male and female, mankind. He named them Adam, mankind when they were created. Malachi 2.15, he did not make, the, uh, did God not make them one, uh, husbands and wives, with a portion of the spirit in their union? Husband, wife, Holy Spirit of God coming together. And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So there's something significant about maleness and femaleness and the way that maleness and femaleness can complement each other in such a way as to reveal who God is and in such a way as to propagate, uh, to continue the species. Certainly the New Testament continues this thread. I'll give you just one. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, Mark 10, 6 to 8. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, at this point in any conversation where society is evolving and scripture now sounds archaic, in any discussion where society is evolving and scripture now sounds archaic, the very first argument is, well, that was for then, this is for now. You see, people are evolving, society is evolving, so those passages, that's just for then, not for now. First of all, that's a very, very dangerous argument. Because now every time culture changes, we have to say that the Bible is wrong. Pretty soon, we're left with no Bible at all. Secondly, there's nothing in the Bible uh, that tells me that every time society changes, the Bible must keep up. It's not the way it goes. Thirdly, let's look at this particular issue theologically. This particular issue theologically, anyone that's attempted 
to defend the idea of gender fluidity from Scripture, well, no one really does try to defend that particular issue from Scripture. I'm sure some do. I, I, I'm not aware of it. But what they do is simply say all of those passages en masse are old and need to be cut out. We have to read the Bible with scissors to ignore that biblically. But if we're going to say, uh, no, we have to interpret those passages differently, normally what is said is that just doesn't fit with today's culture. We've got to allow it to. This is why I say we need to read Scripture not only biblically but theologically. Where does the issue of gender identity flow from theologically first? I want you to notice that this comes from God himself. Equal but with different roles, including a sense of functional headship and submission. This didn't start with man and woman. This is because God himself as Father, Son, and Spirit has always functioned for, throughout all of eternity in diverse relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit, with different roles. Philippians 2, 5 to 11, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and someday all knees will bow and all tongues will confess, but until that day, we have work to do, biblically, theologically, and historically. I want you to notice that theologically speaking, the idea of complementary relationships started with Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father sends the Spirit who is willing to go, then the Father exalts the Son, I'm sorry, sends the Son who is willing to die, and the Father exalts the Son as a result of this. Later, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit who comes down not to do his own work, but to impress upon the hearts and minds of uh, Christians and non-Christians the teaching of Jesus. And so Father, Son, and Spirit working together as a unity in complementary ways is how God has always worked. And so it only makes sense that when God created humanity, and he said, let's make man in our image, let's show the world what, what I am like, what we are like, Father, Son, and Spirit, that God made male and female diversity that work together in a complementary way. It only makes sense. We have to step back and look at the big picture. This truth about God flows down then into mankind. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul talking about there being a clear and obvious difference between men and women. So, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. When Paul dares to speak about something as unbelievably offensive in our culture as a sense in marriage or in the local church of male headship and submission of leadership and response, perhaps by a, a wife. Let's contain this to marriage, as Paul does in this immediate context. He says, first of all, I want you to notice that this is exactly, he says, what we do before Christ. I say, well, of course we, of course we follow Christ's leadership. He's God. And yet Jesus was willing to come down and be a man and die for us. And so whatever the leadership is that's being spoken of here, it's a self-sacrificial leadership that's willing to die on behalf of the other one. And so the other one then joyfully engages and, and follows in that dance. Similarly, he says this is what was going on between Jesus and God, is this idea of headship and submission. Is God somehow a brute that's out of touch with uh, 2019 America and just doesn't understand? How dare you, God, say that you have some sense of headship over the sun? I mean, that's what we're saying. I will not say that. I just see it. I see it here in Philippians. I see it across Scripture. The Father, Son, and Spirit work together as absolute co-equals and yet with a sense of functional headship and submission. And so, not surprisingly, Paul says, in humanity, which God made to reflect the way he works, has always worked, will always work, we see the same thing. Men and women working together in complementary ways. 
sometimes in certain limited roles like uh, a marriage or local church, then God says, I want there to be a unique uh, picture of male leadership here. That's not applied everywhere, by the way. But we do see it here, and it's because that's the way God works. So theologically, what Scripture teaches about men and women being separate, equal, and complementing each other, we can read those proof texts, if you will, out of the Bible. But some want to call themselves Christians and yet throw this teaching out and say, well, well, now wait a minute. So we have to show that what the Bible says fits into the rest of what the Bible says, even about God himself. And the idea of gender as binary and complementary flows directly out of God as trinary and complementary as Trinitarian. Biblically, we read these passages, you either have to take them or cut them out. But if you're going to cut those out, then theologically, you also have to cut out all of the passages that talk about Father, Son, and Spirit working together in complementary ways. And if you do that, you actually have no gospel left. Because every gospel passage talks about Jesus willingly laying down his life at the direction of the Father. And then the Holy Spirit being sent by Jesus to come and draw us to himself by way of loving conviction. And so if we're going to cut out all of the passages in the Bible that talk about God working within himself, Father, Son, and Spirit in complementary ways. And we actually have no gospel left. So we have to be able to look at these issues biblically and theologically Finally, historically, and I'll start first with a quote just from Scripture in this very context, Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, 16. After talking about God's desire that there be distinctions between male and female, he says, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, Paul writes, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. If I may paraphrase, Paul says, in all places where people desire to follow the will of God from the word of God, there's a clear distinction between male and female. Paul says it's just not a big deal. It is what it is, and it's always been. Well, that distinction has followed through the teachings of the church fathers, through the Middle Ages, through the Reformers, through the Puritans, and up until today. Now, why today does it seem like this is such a brand new and pressing question? Why are many Christians that, that claim to believe the Bible getting on board with a teaching that goes directly against the clear teaching of many passages of the Old and New Testament. Why are many today going against what does not fit with the bigger picture of theology that we see from Scripture that has been defined for 2,000 years that many, many, many men and women have burned at the stake for defending? Why in our day are many who call themselves Christians even completely ignoring the 2,000 years of church history that have led up to this point where both scripture and theology have been a clear testimony to the binary nature of male and female as complementary and equal in the eyes of God. It is because of the cries of the crowd. It is because the crowd that Pilate faced on that fateful day was not nearly as loud, as unified, or as implicitly threatening as the crowd that we face today in modern America. Therefore, on this one of many issues that are up for debate in our day, it is crucial that we as Christians learn to think biblically, what does the text say? And we can line up 10 passages that clearly say something. At that point, we could be done unless you're going to take scissors to your Bible and just say those passages don't apply. I don't have anything in Scripture that says that they don't. But we're still not done because we then take those passages and compare them to the broader scope of theology. What else do we know about God from his word? How is this connected to more central issues? And even then we need to look historically because these issues have been ironed out over time. There were major church councils in the first 400 years of church history in which especially Christological heresies were defined and discussed and defended. How? Biblically and theologically. Christians have not been sitting back waiting for us to rescue the faith for 2,000 years. In most ages, they've been more involved and thinking more carefully and writing more deeply about the Christian faith and about all of these issues. The faith is not waiting for us to rescue it. 
but God is waiting for us to get in line with what we see biblically, theologically, and historically. So as we continue to make decisions on difficult issues, on difficult issues like the question of uh, gender and the definitions of gender, I would urge you to think biblically, theologically, and historically. I would urge you to teach your children. It's not enough to hold this view yourself and say so once in a while. You must teach your children how to think biblically, theologically, and historically. Because they will not do it intuitively. It is unintuitive. And lastly, I would urge all of us just as clear as we must be in our presentation of God's truth, we must be equally gracious as we extend God's hope of salvation through Christ to those who see these things differently, to those whose views run contrary to the clear teaching of Scripture. Jesus came to die for your sin and mine. We have no right to dismiss people or write them off. We must go to them in love and grace and plead with them to see the truth of Scripture. Does this make sense? We cannot say, well, I see the truth and dismiss people. We must say, I see the truth. I love you. Will you consider the truth with me? Pilate gave in to the cries of the crowd, and their voices prevailed, so Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. It seems to me that with increasing frequency, those that have walked with God in some way for some time are listening to the voices of the crowd and capitulating on topics that Scripture is very clear about. And the one I brought up is just one of many. We will go out this week into the midst of a crowd that is loud and uniform and implicitly threatening. Will we go out equipped to think over the noise and make decisions biblically, theologically, and historically while genuinely loving and offering grace and inviting all that we come in contact with to know the saving love of Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have been so clear on so many issues that are so important and so divisive in our day. Father, as we see the truth of what you've written, as we see how that truth fits into the big picture, as we see how those truths have been defended for 2,000 years, keep us from arrogance, Lord. Keep us from spiritual pride, Father, I pray that seeing what you have said, understanding an issue biblically, theologically, and historically would drive us to the foot of the cross in humility and would increase our desire to share the gospel lovingly with all. Because, Lord, at the end of the day, you don't see these issues differently. Sin is sin, and we are all sinners together, and you are offering to forgive sin and to draw unto yourself and to give new life. So, Father, forgive us when we draw lines that you're not drawing. Forgive us also, Father, when we refuse to call sin what you have called sin. Help us, Father, to go out with both the clarity that your word affords and the grace that Jesus has given to us and that you have commanded us to extend to others. Father, we confess it is not easy and we need your help. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.